thanks everybody for coming. Um, this is joint work with Jacob uh, Roos, who's here in the audience uh, over there. And uh, please, we'd love to talk to you after the session for all of the kind of uh, uh, open questions that remain, because this is still very much uh, research work. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about why do we even need a new spline? Why is this an interesting problem to solve? And it really comes, this is mostly motivated by font design, but I think that this line has application in other 2D illustration and perhaps other tasks like CAD and uh, you know, uh, self-driving vehicles as well. Um, and uh, it really comes to limitations of Bezier curves. That they're very expressive, it's, an, it's a very powerful primitive for creating illustrations, but it's not easy to learn, it's not intuitive how to control. And particularly within the context of making fonts and variable fonts, that interpolation is a problem. That you can have two endpoints, you can have two masters that are smooth, but then when you do the interpolation between them, the, the resulting uh, set of curves is not continuous, is not smooth, and uh, forms a kink. And this is something you can see in this example, that if you have an interpolation between a, uh, a condensed and an extended, uh, you know, this is the kind of case that can happen. So there are many, many interpolating splines in the literature, and I'll talk about some of those uh, a little bit. I think, especially within the context of making fonts, the best known interpolating spline is the hobby spline, which is used in Metafont. It's also used in Apple iWork, you know, Keynote, uh, to, to do uh, pen-based drawing. So it, it has applications other than uh, just fonts. Uh, and it has some really nice properties. It's, uh, the, uh, mathematically, it's very, very uh, solid work. And in particular, the solver always finds a solution to the spline. There, it never like runs away or fails to converge. Uh, but there are things to not like about it so much that when you push it hard, you get kind of ugly shapes. Uh, and it has this flipping behavior, which hopefully this will work. And uh, I'll be able to, um, uh, to demonstrate it. This is an online implementation by uh, Edmund Weitz. I'm going to press this button so it's less confusing. And so you, know, you place points down. And what an interpolating spline means is that the, the spline goes through the points. There are no off-curve points that you know, control the curve. Uh, uh, it's all on-curve points. And then when you move it, you can see this kind of global behavior that uh, moving this point affects the entire curve. But then when you start to push it, you get these ugly shapes, you get these curvature maxima that are not near the control points. You, if you have a curvature uh, maximum, you really want it to be on the control point because it's salient to the curve. And then if you keep pushing it, it's going to flip. And when you're just sketching, when you're in an interactive application, that behavior is kind of unexpected. It's, it's not a pleasant uh, experience. It doesn't, I, I feel like it doesn't help the creative process uh, to have this kind of flipping behavior where it's sort of changing phase from, from one thing to another. Um, so, you know, I think the, the hobby spline is very interesting, but I feel like it is still perhaps not the ideal uh, spline. Um, so uh, another uh, spline in the literature is the Spiro spline, which I did um, 2007. And this is based on the Euler Spiro spline. Like when I came up with it, I hadn't you know, done a full literature search. And then I found it, that this Kurgla project is uh, from the uh, Norwegian Shipbuilding uh, um, uh, Institute or whatever. And uh, that they were looking for, like traditionally with the shipbuilding, you use a wooden spline. You bend a flexible strip and you, you, know, you constrain it to where it needs to go and then you draw the smooth line there. And they were looking for the kind of computer um, equivalent of that. And they, they um, came up with a spiral uh, using the Euler spiral as the primitive curve. And it works pretty well. Uh, the font in Consolata was designed entirely using this spline as the drawing tool. Uh, it's also been implemented in FontForge and Inkscape, and I'm sure there's other uh, open source um, graphics uh, uh, projects that use it in, in one form or another. And uh, the, smooth, the spline has very smooth curvature. You can, it's almost defined by having really smooth curvature. 
of being very close to a circular arc if the points are you know, arranged in a circular arc. Um, there are also drawbacks, there are disadvantages. And anybody who's played with a spiral spline, if you move the points around, it, uh, it sometimes completely fails and makes these wild, you know, the original version makes uh, patterns that look like a particle, particle accelerator, a physics experiment. Uh, and I think there are other things about the spiral spline that, uh, you know, the, the user interface, there's never been a version of the spiral spline that has a really clean, nice, natural feeling user interface. I think some of that is because the user interface work hasn't been done, and some of it is that there are properties of the spline itself that make it difficult to develop a good user experience on top of it. So I'll give you a quick demo of this also. Um, and so now you can see uh, these kind of very circle-like shapes. And then when you do the same thing where you push it, but it, this is actually the solver in this, uh, yes, yeah, so you see the same flipping behavior as the uh, hobby spline. And then, yeah, there you go, that the solver is completely failing to solve the constraints. This is really written in terms of constraints. And so the red is saying, well, I'm not solving it, but I'm gonna give you my closest approximation. And again, if you're in a really kind of creative sketching, you, know, you just wanna make a lot of shapes and you're, you're looking at the solver that's like jittering and you know, throwing all these things at you, that's also uh, a really bad experience. And I think this is one of the reasons why this virus flight has never achieved a kind of uh, really uh, good uh, amount of usage. So a couple of years ago, Adobe published a paper on what they call Kappa curves. And this uh, is related somehow to the curvature tool that ships in Adobe Illustrator. Although I, I should caution that what's in the paper is one thing, and what's in Adobe Illustrator is another thing. And to understand the relationship between those two is very difficult because um, that, has, that has never been documented. There is no explanation of what's actually in Adobe Illustrator. So when I criticize the Kappa curve tool, um, I will be very clear that I'm criticizing the version that's in the paper. And this is a very interesting spline. Um, it solves the numerical robustness problem. There is always a solution and always a unique solution. And more, and more than that, it has this property that every time you move a control point by a small amount, it only changes the resulting curve by a small amount. So there's a sort of a robustness to this, which is very deep. Now, everything in splines is a trade-off. And uh, so you don't get curvature smoothness as smooth as an Euler spiral spline. And instead, you get these cusps. And I'll, I'm talking about here, I'll show you in, in a little bit. And then as I say, the, the version in the paper is entirely based on uh, quadratic Bézier parabola segments. And that has a lot of serious disadvantages. You can't make a true S shape. It doesn't go perfectly through an inflection point, And it doesn't make a circle. So when you approximate a circle, it's quite lumpy. And you can really, if you compare it, you can say this is really not good enough to do font uh, drawing, uh, the, version, the version in the paper. So, um, you know, I, the, the spiral work was part of my PhD. And I think that one of the more valuable contributions to take from the PhD, even if you don't like the spline that it presented, is this analytical framework uh, that I call two-parameter splines. And the idea is that you have a curved family that is described by two parameters. And so that's the angle on the left side of the curve and the angle on the right side of the curve. And, uh, and then you take these segments and you rotate and scale them into place uh, so that they form the curve, so that the curvature is continuous. The tangent and the curvature is continuous across each control point. And in fact, that defines the spline. If you say, take this curve family and solve the tangents at, the, the, um, at each control point so that the curvature of the resulting spline is continuous, that is the definition of a spline. And it's interesting that, that solving that, doing that kind of numerical solution, 
really only depends on the curvature. The shape in the middle can do anything it's like, it likes. It's only using the curvature of the endpoints to define the behavior of the spline. So this is a framework. Within this framework of two parameters, you can have different curves. And those different curves will have different behavior and different appearance. And in this particular case, the, the green is uh, Adobe uh, Kappa curves, the red is the Euler spiral, and the blue is the new spline that I'm proposing. And this is showing you a two-dimensional uh, parameter space. And you don't have to understand this. This is just um, you know, illustrating this concept of a parameter space and then being able to instantiate it with different curves. And when you take this framework, this one, I think, unifying framework, and you instantiate it with different curves, you get splines with quite different and quite interesting properties. So one possibility is that you instantiate this curve with what's called the elastica, which represents the bending of idealized thin strips. And that gives you the minimum energy curve spline, which is optimum with respect to this particular energy metric, but has a lot of other properties that are not very good. Um, so there, an, there are attempts to like fix that, to still use something based on this Elastica concept, this bending energy concept. And so there's a scale invariant version, which you know is uh, closer to a circle and so on and so forth. That was actually the first version used in the Norwegian shipbuilding project uh, before they found the Euler spiral. Uh, there is the Euler spiral in this family. There's a variance of the Euler spiral, like the uh, log aesthetic trying to kind of tune and tweak. Uh, there's the circle spline. Uh, and then one of the interesting things is, uh, this wasn't in the, 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 the paper, but when I read the paper, I realized that Adobe Kappa curves actually fall into this two-parameter framework, that you can say that this segment that's defined by two, param two parabolas is a curve that you can drop into this framework, and you get a spline. And then the hobby spline almost falls into this framework because the curvature is, um, is an approximate, uh, it's not an exact curvature, it's an approximate curv curvature. So it has the flavor of being in the uh, two parameter family without quite exactly being in there. So you get different properties. When you use a different curve, you get different properties. So the elastica, you get minimum energy. There's many of them have this roundness property, which means that if you place points around a circle, you get a circular arc. Uh, locality is this property about moving a point somewhere in the middle and how far does it ripple out. And the uh, circle spline um, has a very good locality property where it, it does not ripple out. Uh, and then some of the splines, but not all of them, have this unique solution property where there is always one solution to the spline and therefore it is more robust. And so the kappa curves and the hobby spline have this property actually the circle spline as well. Uh, but certainly the Euler spiral uh, and some of these others do not have that property. So there's, there's other properties we can talk about. There's a list of them in, in the thesis. You can, you can go through that. But I think the kind of the, the takeaway lesson here is, you know, I searched for the one true spline that would do everything perfectly. And within this two parameter framework, it's clear that does not exist. Instead, it is a trade-off space where you decide what properties do I want, and then when you know that, then you, have, you can choose a spline, you can choose a curve family that will give you the spline that you want. So the properties I want today are the robustness of the Adobe Kappa curves, and maybe not all of, but most of the smoothness of the Spiro or Euler Spiral spline. And is this possible? Can I combine these? Can I get both of these properties in the same spline? And I think this is the this is the kind of central research question that I'm addressing. And the answer is yes, assuming it loads. I don't think I've solved the problem of flaking network. There we go. Ah, yeah. The the grid there's a grid on there, but the beamer is not showing it. Um, Okay, I can see, I was hoping that I was going to do like a live coding of a, drawing a letter, but with this, this angle, see me afterwards, uh, I'll, I'll happily draw a shape. But now you get a sense of the way that this is performing, especially when you push it, that it's not doing that flipping, uh, and uh, it's, 
um, you know, it's robust that a small change to the control point is a small change to the spline. But we are getting those cusps. We're getting those regions of high curvature, which uh, certainly the Euler spiral spline, the spiral spline uh, does not do. So it has behavior that is more like the uh, Kappa curve in that way, but, I, uh, but has smoothness that is certainly significantly better than, than the Adobe Kappa curve paper. Um, so uh, again, this is an online demo, and please feel free to play with it. Uh, and I will uh, talk about some other uh, aspects of this design. So the, the prototype that I did in December, which is what you saw, is not, is not perfect. It, the smoothness is not as good as it can be. And uh, I spent a lot of time, and here Jacob and I were trying to collaborate on this, to find a mathematical expression that would capture this trade-off of smoothness and robustness. And never quite figured out how to do that. And so I said, let's treat this as a design problem. Let's treat this the way that a font designer would do it, where you have a parameter space, just make a lot of masters and interpolate. And uh, so uh, with symmetries and so on, you don't need very many masters. Like I think 49 is actually the, the number that I want. And just to keep things simple and to keep things efficient, each master is defined in terms of two cubic physics. And so the idea is that you can use this tool. And then, so here you can again see the two parameter. I have one parameter of the angle on the left side, one parameter of the angle on the right side. And this is interpolating through that space. The, the curve at the bottom is a curvature plot. And then if I don't like it, if I think it's a little bit, uh, you know, it, it, it should be smoother, uh, uh, then I can go into the Beziers and edit those and hopefully achieve like a smoother, you know, closer to a linear curvature relationship. So the idea is to use this tool to define the spline and tune it. Like you can tweak it, you can, you can make it do what you like. And when you're done, you do save and you get this JSON file, which is, you know, mostly just a lot of numbers. And then you, um, this part is not done yet, but the idea is you take that and you plug it into the spline and, uh, and then you get to see how does it perform, how, how does it behave. And one idea of having this tool available is to encourage experimentation. Do different people want it tuned in different ways? Or will there be a consensus? Yes, this particular point in the trade-off space between smoothness and robustness and whatever other properties is actually what we all want to use to draw. Um, another problem that Spyro solves is straight to curve uh, transitions. That you want to go from a straight line to a curved line, but you don't want to just attach a circular arc because that will be very rough. And so Spyro used this concept of one-way constraints, which solved the problem very nicely, but the UX was very difficult. That you had to control like which direction does it go, and it was not a very natural uh, user experience at all. Um, so that was an unsatisfying uh, aspect to that. And in the new spline, I have a different approach, which is using these uh, tangent constraints. So you, you go onto the point, and you say, I want it to point this direction. And if it points the same direction as an adjoining line, then you still have that smooth, straight to curve transition where the curvature ramps up slowly uh, from, from zero. Uh, and then the same user interface uh, element is also useful for setting the tangents at extrema which is very important for fonts. You don't want it to bubble slightly past the, the point, uh, you know, if, if that's the baseline and uh, alignment zone. And Spyro did not have a mechanism for this, so you had to kind of fill it by hand. So I think that this one mechanism is useful for, for both of these uh, features. So this is still research in progress. It's not done. Uh, this will be, I, will, I hope, the main drawing tool in the upcoming uh, Rune Bender font editor. You saw a very early preview yesterday that was still Bezier based, but this is a, a next step is to integrate this line. Uh, there's more work that needs to be done on the implementation. The solver is like 99% robust. Let's get that last 1%. Uh, re implement it. This is the prototype is in JavaScript. I want to do it in Rust or maybe C, which might help some other open source projects. Uh, the tangent constraints are not perfect, they need to be fine tuned. I want this answer to this question of, is there one tuning or many? Uh, we need to do real user interface work. How do you draw naturally? How do you uh, enable a creative flow? Because I feel like that really has not been done with these lines. 
The work is all under a permissive license. I was seeking patents. They're all uh, in the public. Uh, and then I want to thank Google for uh, funding this work uh, that, we'll, that we'll be able to work on full time. Thanks very much.